Steve Jobs 1997-2011 Return to Apple In 1996, Apple announced that it would buy Next for $427 million. The deal was finalized in February 1997, bringing Jobs back to the company he had co-founded. Jobs became de facto chief after then-CEO Gil Emilio was ousted in July 1997. He was formally named interim chief executive in September. In March 1998, to concentrate Apple's efforts on returning to profitability, Jobs terminated a number of projects, such as Newton, CyberDog, and OpenDoc. In the coming months, many employees developed a fear of encountering Jobs while riding in the elevator, afraid that they might not have a job when the doors opened. The reality was that Jobs' summary executions were rare, but a handful of victims was enough to terrorize a whole company. Jobs changed the licensing program for Macintosh clones, making it too costly for the manufacturers to continue making machines. With the purchase of Next, much of the company's technology found its way into Apple products, most notably Next Step, which evolved into Mac OS X. Under Jobs' guidance, the company increased sales significantly with the introduction of the iMac and other new products. Since then, appealing designs and powerful branding had worked well for Apple. At the 2000 Mac World Expo, Jobs officially dropped the interim modifier from his title at Apple and became permanent CEO. Jobs quipped at the time that he would be using the title ISO. The company subsequently branched out, introducing and improving upon other digital appliances. With the introduction of the iPod Portable Music Player, iTunes Digital Music Software, and the iTunes Store, the company made forays into consumer electronics and music distribution. On June 29, 2007, Apple entered the cellular phone business with the introduction of the iPhone, a multi-touch display cell phone, which also included the features of an iPod and, with its own mobile browser, revolutionized the mobile browsing scene. While nurturing innovation, Jobs also reminded his employees that real artists ship, deliver product. Jobs had a public war of words with Dell computer CEO Michael Dell, starting in 1987, when Jobs first criticized Dell for making uninnovative beige boxes. On October 6, 1997, at a Gartner symposium, when Dell was asked what he would do if he ran the then-troubled Apple computer company, he said, I'd shut it down and give the money back to the shareholders. Then, in 2006, Jobs sent an email to all employees when Apple's market capitalization rose above Dell's. Team, it turned out that Michael Dell wasn't perfect at predicting the future. Based on today's stock market close, Apple is worth more than Dell. Stocks go up and down, and things may be different tomorrow, but I thought it was worth a moment of reflection today. Steve Jobs was both admired and criticized for his consummate skill at persuasion and salesmanship, which has been dubbed the reality distortion field and was particularly evident during his keynote speeches, colloquially known as Steve Notes, at Macworld Expos and at Apple Worldwide Developers Conferences. Jobs was a board member at Gap Incorporated from 1999 to 2002. In 2001, Jobs was granted stock options in the amount of 7.5 million shares of Apple with an exercise price of $18.30. It was alleged that the options had been backdated, and that the exercise price should have been $21.10. It was further alleged that Jobs had thereby incurred taxable income of $20 million that he did not report and that Apple overstated its earnings by that same amount. As a result, Jobs potentially faced a number of criminal charges and civil penalties. The case was the subject of active criminal and civil government investigations, though an independent internal Apple investigation completed on December 29, 2006 found that Jobs was unaware of these issues and that the options granted to him were returned without being exercised in 2003. In 2005, Jobs responded to criticism of Apple's poor recycling programs for e-waste in the U.S. by lashing out at environmental and other advocates at Apple's annual meeting in Cupertino in April. A few weeks later, Apple announced it would take back iPods for free at its retail stores. The computer take-back campaign responded by flying a banner from a plane over the Stanford University graduation at which Jobs was the commencement speaker. The banner read Steve, Don't be a mini player, recycle all e-waste. In 2006, he further expanded Apple's recycling programs to any U.S. customer who buys a new Mac. This program includes shipping and environmentally friendly disposal of their old systems. 
The success of Apple's unique products and services provided several years of stable financial returns, propelling Apple to become the world's most valuable publicly traded company in 2011. Jobs was perceived as a demanding perfectionist who always aspired to position his businesses and their products at the forefront of the information technology industry by foreseeing and setting innovation and style trends. He summed up this self-concept at the end of his keynote speech at the Macworld Conference and Expo in January 2007, by quoting ice hockey player Wayne Gretzky. There's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple. Since the very, very beginning. And we always will. On July 1, 2008, a 7 billion US dollars class action suit was filed against several members of the Apple Board of Directors for revenue loss because of alleged securities fraud. In a 2011 interview with biographer Walter Isaacson, Jobs revealed that he had met with US President Barack Obama, complained about the nation's shortage of software engineers, and told Obama that he was headed for a one-term presidency. Jobs proposed that any foreign student who got an engineering degree at a US university should automatically be offered a green card. After the meeting, Jobs commented, The president is very smart, but he kept explaining to us reasons why things can't get done. It infuriates me. Health Issues In October 2003, Jobs was diagnosed with cancer. In mid-2004, he announced to his employees that he had a cancerous tumor in his pancreas. The prognosis for pancreatic cancer is usually very poor, Jobs stated that he had a rare much less aggressive type, known as islet cell neuroendocrine tumor. Despite his diagnosis, Jobs resisted his doctor's recommendations for medical intervention for nine months, instead relying on alternative medicine to thwart the disease. According to Harvard researcher Ramsey Omri, his choice of alternative treatment led to an unnecessarily early death. Other doctors agree that Jobs' diet was insufficient to address his disease. Cancer researcher and alternative medicine critic David Gorski, for instance, said, my best guess was that Jobs probably only modestly decreased his chances of survival, if that. Barry R. Cassie Leth, the chief of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center's Integrative Medicine Department, said, Jobs' faith in alternative medicine likely cost him his life. He had the only kind of pancreatic cancer that is treatable and curable. He essentially committed suicide. According to Jobs' biographer, Walter Isaacson, for nine months he refused to undergo surgery for his pancreatic cancer a decision he later regretted as his health declined. Instead, he tried a vegan diet, acupuncture, herbal remedies, and other treatments he found online, and even consulted a psychic. He was also influenced by a doctor who ran a clinic that advised juice fasts, bowel cleansings and other unproven approaches, before finally having surgery in July 2004. He eventually underwent a pancreatic aduodenectomy, or Whipple procedure, in July 2004 that appeared to remove the tumor successfully. Jobs did not receive chemotherapy or radiation therapy. During Jobs' absence, Tim Cook, head of worldwide sales and operations at Apple, ran the company. In early August 2006, Jobs delivered the keynote for Apple's annual Worldwide Developers Conference. His thin, almost gaunt appearance and unusually listless delivery, together with his choice to delegate significant portions of his keynote to other presenters, inspired a flurry of media and internet speculation about the state of his health. In contrast, according to an Ars Technica Journal report, Worldwide Developers Conference, WWDC, attendees who saw Jobs in person said he looked fine. Following the keynote, an Apple spokesperson said that Steve's health is robust. Two years later, Similar concerns follow Jobs' 2008 WWDC keynote address. Apple officials stated that Jobs was victim to a common bug and was taking antibiotics, while others surmised his cachectic appearance was due to the Whipple procedure. During a July conference call discussing Apple earnings, participants responded to repeated questions about Jobs' health by insisting that it was a private matter. Others said that shareholders had a right to know more given Jobs' hands-on approach to running his company. Based on an off-the-record phone conversation with Jobs, the New York Times reported, while his health problems amounted to a good deal more than a common bug, they weren't life-threatening and he doesn't have a recurrence of cancer. On August 28, 2008, 
Bloomberg mistakenly published a 2,500-word obituary of Jobs in its corporate news service, containing blank spaces for his age and cause of death. News carriers customarily stockpile up-to-date obituaries to facilitate news delivery in the event of a well-known figure's death, although the error was promptly rectified. Many news carriers and blogs reported on it, intensifying rumors concerning Jobs' health. Jobs responded at Apple's September 2008 Let's Rock keynote by paraphrasing Mark Twain. Reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. At a subsequent media event, Jobs concluded his presentation with a slide reading 11070, referring to his blood pressure, stating he would not address further questions about his health. On December 16, 2008, Apple announced that marketing vice president Phil Schiller would deliver the company's final keynote address at the Macworld Conference and Expo 2009, again reviving questions about Jobs' health. In a statement given on January 5, 2009, on Apple.com, Jobs said that he had been suffering from a hormone imbalance for several months. On January 14, 2009, Jobs wrote in an internal Apple memo that in the previous week he had learned that my health-related issues are more complex than I originally thought. He announced a six-month leave of absence until the end of June 2009, to allow him to better focus on his health. Tim Cook, who previously acted as CEO in Jobs' 2004 absence, became acting CEO of Apple with Jobs still involved with major strategic decisions. In 2009, Tim Cook offered a portion of his liver to Jobs, since both share a rare blood type. The donor liver can regenerate tissue after such an operation, Jobs yelled, I'll never let you do that. I'll never do that. In April 2009, Jobs underwent a liver transplant at Methodist University Hospital Transplant Institute in Memphis, Tennessee. Jobs' prognosis was described as excellent. Resignation. On January 17, 2011, a year and a half after Jobs returned to work following the liver transplant, Apple announced that he had been granted a medical leave of absence. Jobs announced his leave in a letter to employees, stating his decision was made so he could focus on his health. As it did at the time of his 2009 medical leave, Apple announced that Tim Cook would run day-to-day -day operations and that Jobs would continue to be involved in major strategic decisions at the company. Despite the leave, Jobs appeared at the iPad 2 launch event, March 2, the WWDC keynote introducing iCloud, June 6, and before the Cupertino City Council, June 7. On August 24, 2011, Jobs announced his resignation as Apple's CEO, writing to the board, I have always said if there ever came a day when I could no longer meet my duties and expectations as Apple's CEO, I would be the first to let you know. Unfortunately, that day has come. Jobs became chairman of the board and named Tim Cook as his successor as CEO. Jobs continued to work for Apple until the day before his death six weeks later. Death Jobs died at his Palo Alto, California, home around 3 p.m., PDT, on October 5, 2011, due to complications from a relapse of his previously treated islet cell pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, which resulted in respiratory arrest. He had lost consciousness the day before and died with his wife, children, and sisters at his side. His sister, Mona Simpson, described his death thus, Steve's final words, hours earlier, were monosyllables, repeated three times. Before embarking, he looked at his sister Patty, then for a long time at his children, then at his life's partner, Laureen, and then over their shoulders past them. Steve's final words were, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. He then lost consciousness and died several hours later. A small private funeral was held on October 7, 2011, the details of which, out of respect for Jobs' family, were not revealed. Apple and Pixar each issued announcements of his death. Apple announced on the same day that they had no plans for a public service, but were encouraging well-wishers to send their remembrance messages to an email address created to receive such messages. Apple and Microsoft both flew their flags at half-staff throughout their respective headquarters and campuses. Bob Iger ordered all Disney properties, including Walt Disney World and Disneyland, to fly their flags at half-staff from October 6 to 12, 2011. For two weeks following his death, Apple displayed on its corporate website a simple page that showed Jobs' name and lifespan next to his grayscale portrait. On October 19, 2011, Apple employees held a private memorial service for Jobs on the Apple campus in Cupertino. Jobs' widow, Laureen, was in attendance, as well as Cook, Bill Campbell, Nora Jones, Al Gore, and Coldplay. 
Some of Apple's retail stores closed briefly so employees could attend the memorial. A video of the service was uploaded to Apple's website. California Governor Jerry Brown declared Sunday, October 16, 2011, to be Steve Jobs Day. On that day, an invitation-only memorial was held at Stanford University. Those in attendance included Apple and other tech company executives, members of the media, celebrities, close friends of Jobs, and politicians, along with Jobs' family. Bono, Yo-Yo Ma, and Joan Baez performed at the service, which lasted longer than an hour. The service was highly secured, with guards at all of the university's gates, and a helicopter flying overhead from an area news station. Each attendee was given a small brown box as a farewell gift from Jobs. The box contained a copy of the autobiography of a yogi by Paramansa Yogananda. Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, former owner of what would become Pixar, George Lucas, former rival, Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, and President Barack Obama all offered statements in response to his death. Jobs is buried in an unmarked grave at Alta Mesa Memorial Park, the only non-sectarian cemetery in Palo Alto.